And so I actually did make some pointers about the book. And he wrote, literature is the art of writing something that will be read twice. Journalism is the art of writing something that will be read once. I believe, honestly, that the Mohammed and the Book of Power will be read many, many times over four decades. And so that I really wanted that to be the introduction note for this panel. So, Musharraf, to start off with, what is the difference between a kissa and a dastan and a hikayat or an epic story? Uh, nobody knows the difference, but I just put a name there. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there is actually a difference. There's a very uh, vague difference, but it's a very long discussion. Uh, briefly, uh, Qissa is uh, something in which events happen, uh, events of a certain na nature happen once, and then it comes to a culmination. There's a determined end of, uh, to that. There are also, of course, no dialogues. Um, in a Dastan, on the other hand, there could be dialogue, there could be a non-specific um, uh, end, it remains slightly loose and it carries on. In Urdu, the name Qissa and Dastan have been used interchangeably. Sometimes it's, um, the adventures of Amir Hamza uh, is called Qissa Amir Hamza, sometimes it's called Dastan Amir Hamza. But uh, we, we have not really made uh, a determination about the nature of these texts because we have not really looked at our classical texts in a, in, a, in a serious manner or found them worthy of serious study. So this is one, one reason why we lack um, in any kind of uh, fixed definition or we, we lack any kind of resources. If you read such and such a book, you'll have a fair enough idea of how this thing can be described. So it sounds like it sounds like critical appraisal of the genre has potentially been missing then, you think? Yes, it has. Okay. So, you know, um, when did you first dis decide that you wanted to write such a book? Um, I've always been fascinated by classical texts. I've been reading them for, uh, for research uh, for my translation of Tilismo Shoba, Dastane Miranda, which started the whole, you know, looking up different names and uh, strange sort of phenomena uh, in, 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 in classical texts which uh, predate them. And uh, this specific story um, came from a small passage which is which I have mentioned in the book. It's about um, a man of the sea, somebody, a, a half human, half uh, a fish kind of creature who is caught and produced before a king. It's not specified who was that king or, you know, whether it's a king from the Abbasi times or uh, from the Islamic dynasty. It just says that a man was produced before him and he used to talk in a particular language which nobody could understand. So they decided, uh, somebody at the court decided that he should be paired with a human, um, a, a, a woman, so that their offspring would know the language of both mother and father. And then he could interpret, you know, what this person is saying. So after that long experiment, when the child was finally able to speak, uh, the king asked him, what does your father say? And he says, he always says the same thing, that in animals, that the tail is always at the back. But in humans, and among whom he pointed the king, the tail <laughs> is at the, the tail grows from the chin. So <laughs> he was he was thrown out after that. <laughs> so this was the end of the poor man of the sea. But this gave me an idea of you know how somebody like a creature like this could be introduced and you know brought uh, into a story. So you know um, one of the things that struck me about the book, and obviously there are going to be spoilers. So I'm sorry for that. Um, but the book is so rich and dense that you will definitely not be lacking for them. But I will say that the narrative structure of the book, there are some risks you take, technical risks. And I think you know what I'm talking about. One of them you already said, there is very little dialogue in the book. Now that is a remarkable achievement for a book of that size to go without dialogue. What do you think about that? Because I hate dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even in my novels, I try to 
um, avoid dialogue as much as I can. In between clay and dust, there is hardly any dialogue except at you know some very important occasions where something has to be said and interpreted in the wrong and the right way. Um, I I also don't like reading out from a book. I think reading is something it's it's something which should be done at home by the reader and not by the writer, you know, bringing on, I mean, I'm just talking about myself, you know, that's my voice, <laughs> uh, about, you know, uh, a text, because it, it spoils, uh, it gives me nothing, it spoils my pleasure of the book. So I'd rather read the book myself. Having said that, I also struggle a lot with dialogue. Um, how, as, as somebody writing in English, um, from this part of the world, how do you, how do you make your dialogue sound natural, as if it was spoken in Urdu or Punjabi or whatever language, you know, that is pertinent to that. So, um, I always think that if you remove all kind of accents and trappings and idiomatic use of English and just make it very plain, then you can communicate the essence of the dialogue because then it's, it's just, you know, some words that are being spoken which can be understood by the reader without any kind of uh, pre-imagined shades of meaning in that. So that's why as, as a writer of English writing about certain situations in the society, like two of my previous novels were The Story of the Widow and uh, The Story of a Widow and Between Clay and Dust, um, I struggle with dialogue. So, but in, the, in, in coming back to this book, this particular question, I could completely avoid the dialogue, which was great. You know, some friends said, there should be some dialogue, and I said, no. Uh, I like it like this, because some texts have to remind you that you're not, it's not everyday, it's not an everyday dialogue that's taking place. Yeah. That intimacy with, uh, with, the, with that period or with those um, characters is denied you by the absence of dialogue. So, you know, we're going to be renting, aren't we? So, uh, I especially. It, it, it brings me to a very interesting observation. You know, a lot of literature that we read, especially in this room, particularly because a lot of that is in English. And um, most of us, most of Pakistan, does not read in English. They still read in Hindi, and Urdu. Um, so, a lot of the literature and aesthetic values that have been imposed on the Indian subcontinent or South Asia are not values that are original to this area. They're not Aboriginal or Indigenous. They're values imposed by colonizers. So the idea of dialogue not being in a story is actually perfect for a story like the Kissa. I personally believe that because that was the historical way of doing things and we don't have to follow templates laid down by writers in the West. Um, so I thought that was, uh, uh, well, that was risky, but it was obviously you had your own reasons for that. But on a technical level, that is a difficult feat it is a, not everyone understands that, but it is difficult to pull something like that off, um, and at the same time make sure that the reader's interest is maintained and that there is no it, the book doesn't drag. And I think you escape that by doing something very clever. You keep your chapters very short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the chapters are short, but I uh, I think uh, it's it. Sometimes the nature of the, the story was such that he's constantly referring to either um, researching and referring to events in the past, um, trying to analyze certain events, uh, how they fit in with uh, other things. So uh, that also was a factor. Um, having said that, uh, one takes that risk and uh, this this book went through many many drafts um, i usually plan all my work now that when i write something i have the template in front of me okay this is going to be the story but uh, with this that story did not hold it kept uh, disintegrating and then i kept finding more stuff which was which i thought was pertinent to the story and it was uh, at at one level i knew it was so i kept changing and inserting new material and bringing so you know the whole thing had to be read and many times over uh, and uh, in the end there was no plot but there I is. I believe you said it was five years that you... Yes, it was five years. But once you, but you know, once you get used to um, write in a particular kind of way or once you've attempted something, then it becomes easier, then you, the next time you know how it's all going to work. So, 
So, you know, you said that um, for you it, it wasn't much of a risk, but it was something that you wanted to do because that was true to the book, or authentic to the book. It reminds me of this quote by Annie Dillard. Um, you know, she wrote an essay in the New Yorker, uh, I think 1989, 1990, where she basically says that there is a particular uh, story or a particular theme that you have never read on a page. You've never read that on a page because no one has written it. So you begin with your own interests. You were sent here to give voice to your own astonishment. And I feel like books of this that take these risks that are really truly labors of love, that really don't go with commercial undertakings or commercial necessities, really become tools of change. They become very powerful genre defining or literature defining moments. Um, do you hope that with a book like this, you could create this trend? Because the uh, only, I could think of very few books to compare with this. I mean, Maluf has done some work in this genre. Samarkand, I think, and Balthazar's Odyssey are a couple of books that came to mind. Are you familiar, familiar with them at all? Um. I've read some of Amin Malouf's work in uh, Professor Mohammed Umar Memon's translation. Uh, it was an excerpt from a novel. Uh, I'm forgetting which one, but uh, I, of course, I'm familiar with the nature of his nature of his work. Uh, but it's uh, as I said, you have to, after a period of time, you have to believe that what you find interesting would uh, would be of interest to some other people too, uh, and that comes from reading not just in one particular genre but in a variety of genres uh, reading all kinds of stuff and coming to um, coming to an understanding that you don't have to take yourself very seriously all the time you know you can you can become relaxed and just write something which you enjoy i love creatures you know monsters and all that so <laughs> why not i'm sure others will too so you gravitate towards the weird is that what you're saying? Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, speaking of genre, the dirty word genre, um, I don't know if most of us are familiar with that word being dirty, the word genre, um, versus realist or literary highbrow fiction. But that is actually interesting. It's a good segue because my next uh, point of was about genre. So what, you know, they say, especially in the science fiction, fantasy, and horror circles, that genre is a conversation between writers past, present, and future. So I've always found that a very useful definition for genre, rather than saying popular fiction is a genre or literary is a genre. Do you, what genre do you believe your book to belong to? The Kissa, duh. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you see, uh, this is a Kissa in the sense that it tells a story in episodic form and it goes back and forth. But it can be read as a novel. It can be read without any trappings, you know, neither a novel nor a it's a, just a story or just a narrative which is of a particular kind and which, you know, which is interesting, I hope. Um, as, as, um, as a writer, the more, the longer you work with the narrative, uh, the more complex it becomes in the sense that you no longer know if it remains what you had started with uh, you know you you think it's a great story but after working on it for five years or like four years something like that um, you you lose that control you no longer know whether it really is a good story because you are in it and you hate it and in parts you are just you know tired of it and you want to get it done huh. <laughs> so uh, no no real genre as such just a story so a couple of things that came to my mind that I was, because, you know, sometimes it's nice to split rather than put together. Um, I was thinking maybe historical fiction, then I started thinking the obvious, which would be most of people would think of this as fantasy, right? A lot of people would say it's fantasy, it's a merman from, a merman from the sea, that's what the story is about. So I have a different argument on this. So there is a great short story called The Tower of Babylon. It's by Ted Chiang, um, and the story is about how the actual engineering hmm. or mechanics would happen if one were to create a tower that would reach and breach the heavens. So when Tom Dish, the critic and writer Tom Dish read that story, he called it Babylonian science fiction. Because the story, while it is set in a fantasy world or in a historical world, is pertinent and true to the science of that time. True. I would argue that the Merman 
uh, in the book of power is ontological science fiction. Um, I'll agree with that because um, I will agree with that because uh, Kazvini was a scientist uh, beside being a jurist and a scholar of uh, um, of uh, of the law. He was essentially a scientist and he had access to the the most advanced knowledge that was available because the Abbasids were a very very powerful empire and they had all kind of resources. Um, Khwarizmi, who um, sorry Al Tusi, who leaves, uh, who's briefly mentioned in the text, and then he leaves uh, Baghdad. He goes and founds uh, the first observatory in Uzbekistan, and that is you know it's like setting up the Hubble telescope there. So th these people were at at a very advanced level of uh, scientific uh, knowledge procurement as well as scientific uh, contribution. So it makes sense. I saw that comment that you had tweeted and I said yes, it makes sense because it's good for me, you know, somebody <laughs> saying <laughs> moreover. But it's, it's great that you have made that connection because I did not look at it in that sense. But yes, it is science of the time. So I will read this one line that I did make a comment on because I really think it's true to the thematics of the story. So it's a story of the search for structure and science, taxonomy, cosmography, and the making of the most famous best in Islamic history. That to me makes this a work of ontological science fiction or the Basit science fiction. Um, do you have any comment on that? Should I move on? Okay. <laughs> so you know, we'll move on to aesthetics. This is something you and I talked about briefly. Um, this is a beautiful book. It is just a pleasure to hold this in your hand. You know, in this time of ebooks and torrents and uh, a couple of places online that I won't name, um, it is just a book that forces you to buy it. And I think that used to be the past because manuscripts used to be beautiful. And I think you mentioned something to that account, right? About books being a heritage. Uh, yes, uh, Kazvini's book was uh, very richly illustrated. It has, it's one of the most uh, copied book in Islamic history, I think, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of a text of that nature. Of course, religious texts are more uh, numerous, but, um, but this particular text, Ajayb al-Makhluqat wa Gharayb al was um, copied across the region from Turkey to Iran to uh, India and uh, Arabia, of course, and it's found in many, many manuscripts. I've seen one of his earlier manuscripts, which was uh, in the hands of, uh, which has been, which has passed through the hands of Kazvini. Uh, Danish gave me the PDF for that. Uh, so, uh, so, but this book, I wanted it to have some sort of, some reflection of the nature of Kazvini's work, a kind of tribute to it. Um, this kind of tribute naturally raises the cost of paper, and <laughs> but but that had to uh, that had to go. Uh, but this uh, this book is is also a reflection of what what, what you can achieve or, or what was achievable in those times with with this kind of you know uh, illustration. So there are a couple of uh, publications uh, in the West. Centipede Press is an independent press that does a lot of that. So they sell their books for $125. Um, they, they're just beautiful pieces. Um, Aegis Press in the UK does that too. Um, so this, it struck me that with, with Kitab and with this book, we might launch a trend like that. That would be lovely to see. Um, I will make a call out to Michelle Faruqi's illustrations. I mean, they are incredible. And I don't think that the book could be what it is without the work. Would you agree? I don't agree. You have to go home afterwards. <laughs> Nani, I totally agree. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Faiza Noon, who's sitting here, who um, made the cover, front and back cover. I just painted the back cover. Illustration is Michelle's. So you know, um, so physical aesthetics of books as works of art. You know, we kind of hit that point. So thematics. Uh, okay, now here we're truly going to enter um, spoiler territory. So you want to shove your fingers in your ears, you're welcome. Um, so, so the thematics of the books are very interesting to me. So on the surface, it is the search for um, it's the search for structure. It is also the compiling of a compilation of a best story. There's also a thread of apocalypse running through the book. 
but also dissolution. And I want to talk about that a little bit um, because for me, the book became an ode to grief and anxiety. It was a commentary for me on the passing of an era. It felt like that after the Mongol invasion and destruction, there was this one man who had to collude with the invaders to preserve his own legacy. And at the same time, via that collusion, whether he wanted to or not, was forced to search for meaning in the post Abbasi slash post Islamic golden days era. And I strongly felt that was a very strong thread in the book. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Um, yes, uh, Al-Tusi, um, Khazwini, and others uh, of their caliber who were scholars and the top, uh, they were also bureaucrats. So when uh, the Mongols had a policy that whenever they invaded a place, they would slaughter those who uh, stood against them, but they would retain the complete bureaucracy because they were not idiots um, like us. <laughs> so they, they believed in continuity of, uh, of processes. So they knew that if, a, uh, if we have a top bureaucrat from this particular region or from this particular government, they would, uh, they would help us you know, figure out the solution to problems because they've been dealing with it for ages and ages. Uh, that is why they retained all, that, all these top people will say, what was Al-Tusi Halagu Khan? But Al-Tusi was there at Alamut negotiating with the, uh, with the uh, unka jo Amir tha, uh, Alamut ka uske saath, was negotiate kiya ki, you surrender, we will, we will burn down all the books which belong to theology, but we will keep all the books which, are, which relate to science, which relate to uh, non-religious topics. So this, this was the thinking that you will say that Mongol is not aware of it, but the Mongol knew that the knowledge has to be separated from the belief system. We will continue with the knowledge because they were setting up an empire. They, they were going about it in a very methodical manner. They were brutal, but they were, they were very conscious of their, their, their place in, uh, in history. Uh, Genghis Khan was, so was Halaku Khan and, and his other uh, sons. And they wanted to have that now for the Muslims. Uh, they, you can say there are two parallels. There is one parallel at least. Uh, what happened to the Indian elite, Indian Muslim elite after 1857? They, a lot of them were killed uh, who resisted. But a lot of others, including families of Hakim Ajmal Khan and Sir Sayyid and many others, they had to form, they had to submit to a kind of compromise with the British. And they said, yes, we will continue to serve you in the interests of our community or in our personal self-interest. And we will bring, we will be a kind of buffer, we will be kind of intermediaries between the government and the people so that you, know, you no longer feel threatened by us. Similarly, uh, in, this, in this age, uh, Khazwini and others, they felt that they could still continue to do their research, contribute to the, uh, to the banks of knowledge if they joined. But uh, as I explore in this, they must have joined at some kind of uh, cost to their to their their conscience, to their integrity, to they must have found it difficult to uh, uh, how do they how do they adjust to the reality that two weeks ago they were they had submitted to the caliph who has been killed by Alaku Khan and now they are working for Alaku Khan as his uh, functionaries. So these people were not callous. They they were very sensitive people and they, they must have found it difficult to, you know, come to that compromise, but they did. And, and the death of the caliph is really graphic. I mean, it is, uh, you know, in the first four pages, you pretty much set the tone for the book. That, you know, this is a book that's not going to spare the reader um, from the cruelties inflicted in those times. Because, you know, as we often talk about, that the history is really violent. And yes, it is. It's a really violent history. Um, you mentioned about 800,000 people, I think, who were killed by the Mongols. Something like that, 500,000. We don't know. We, it's, it was a very large number. It was such a large number that 
uh, you could smell the rot from outside the city. So, you know, so many people had been killed. So, you know, the, um, so I, I wrote this, made this comment. The book leaves me with the sense that it is hiding more than is apparent. Like the eponymous book of power, it is a mystery awaiting skillful masters. But, you know, I could also sense the fun and the whimsy of the writer in it. So there is a dry wit about the book. There is a sense of this omniscient narrator who is laughing at these men of turbans scrambling about like so many petty little men with their petty little desires, which will eventually bring us to the servant world, which we get to later. Um, I don't laugh as often as at the men of turban as I laugh at fellow writers. <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of notorious for that. But I did have a lot of fun writing it. And uh, that's all. I, <laughs> that's all I will say. <laughs> I definitely sense there's more to it than just the guy. Um, so, uh, come going to the next. Uh, we'll kind of say. I, I will just say. I will just say that uh, you you notice something about this book. This this book is not a book by itself. It's part of a project which shall be revealed over the course of the next few years. And it was submitted as such to the publishers, but they said, no, this is too crazy. We can't deal with it. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, fine. But in doing so, you have given us a best read and an encyclopedia. So for any writers in the crowd, this is a great, great resource and idea of ideas. I mean, you could really use that as a launch pad to create your own stories and worlds. Um, so we're talking about the problem of um, Kazmini's weird scrambling at times and his violent impulses, uh, pseudo-violent or misogynistic almost impulses. So there is this one chapter that I will briefly hint about, and we won't go into that. I will leave that for your enjoyment later on. But there is a chapter in which there's an orgy going on. Is it? <laughs> and I thought it was a very interesting. Uh, I will never uh, allow such a thing to happen. <laughs> I cannot allow such a thing to happen. I'm sure it's a mistake, but. Uh, what makes you think it's an orgy? <laughs> <laughs> because there are about a dozen people copulating in the scene. <laughs> you have to buy the book now. You know. <laughs> no, no further comment. <laughs> I thought that was a very interesting chapter. Um, you know, jokes aside, because it is certainly a chapter that's written, I think, quite deliberately through the male gaze. And um, there was a feeling of, they, you know, um, when Umar Khayyam's Rubaiyat were first translated by Edward Fitzgerald, um, he made it sound like Umar Khayyam's era was a very um, uh, hedonistic era. And I know there's, there was a lot of critical analysis of that and critical refutals of that. But this chapter really seemed like um, where you really went into um, what a harem might have been like. And you were playing with the um, with the scene. It it was funny. I thought it was really funny too, because you could tell it was really over the top. Uh, I feel sorry for people who have bought this for their children, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I will say that uh, that that part of the narrative as well is very much a part of Kissas and Dastans. Um, they are an integral part of it, and call it male gaze call it uh, what you want, but that was the reality of the world uh, of the time that we speak. So um, I could not escape that, but uh, I was conscious that it will be interpreted in this way. Uh, I had a discussion with my editor, Simmer Puneet, um, who's very sensitive to these things. And I asked her, you know, what do you think? She said, no, this, this should go because it's it's, uh, it's integral to the nature of the narrative. And uh, I made the decision with, you know, knowing full well that it, it will be, you know, it will be um, looked at or interpreted in that way. But I said, that's fine. Uh, it's the nature of the text. Let's go with it. Yeah. The reason why I found that chapter fascinating, besides the excessive sex, uh, was also because it is actually a very empowering scene. It is, uh, it is a scene in which, and I, again, there is a little spoiler here, where the slave girl actually um, comes of sexual age, so to speak. She actually is someone 
who takes the power away from Kazmini and leaves him pseudo castrated. And I thought by the end of the scene, he was the one who was completely weakened um, and denervated. And I thought that was remarkable. It was really skillful, I thought. <laughs> so, um, you know, in chapter 50, because there's an interesting line about, uh, or uh, allusion to Kazmini wondering about the futility of his life's work. And I made a special note of that, um, where he says the pleasures and consequently the miseries of the flesh are becoming, whether they are becoming a distraction for him or not, and whether, you know, this all his work was worth it. And it kind of put me in mind about, uh, again, the book that I mentioned earlier, The Enemies of Promise by Cyril Connolly, in which uh, Connolly proposes something very interesting. He says, whom the gods wish to destroy, they first fall promising. And then he goes on to enumerate and list reasons that become hindrances to writers producing great art or doing meaningful work. Um, in your 15 years of being a professional writer and scholar, what advice would you give to people in this regard? Or what are your thoughts on it in general? Uh, take yourself less seriously than you do. If you, t if you don't take yourself too seriously, take yourself even less seriously. <laughs> Because that's the only way you could uh, you could do anything of of value, as long as we uh, and I always uh, typical interview questions you know newspapers send you so what advice do you have to give to young people or you know students or young writers, and the advice is always to read the masters. Um, your contemporaries are not masters because they are all still struggling, uh, and you have to realize that. If, if you think that, uh, if you start thinking that, okay, I'm as good as Dickens now, you will stop reading Dickens and learning from Dickens. Um, I don't have um, much faith in, in the MFAs or, you know, the creative writing programs, but I still feel that Dickens, whom I consider a master, had he known about uh, the existence of a uh, writing program, creative writing program, I'm sure he would have gone and enrolled just to find out what he can learn because he had that spirit. So if we, if we uh, uh, start focusing more on the classics and then compare how, how do we measure up to that kind of narrative or you know, that kind of delivery and that kind of uh, uh, project, then we are on the way, on our way to you know, some kind of uh, uh, middling success of sorts uh, because otherwise how will we measure ourselves up if we, if we are the kings in our eyes that you know we have reached the pinnacle of writing then you might as well you know shut down because you have written your great work and uh, uh, you mentioned people finding it hard to best themselves like Ghalib was an example his first Diwan was written, uh, some of his best work in which he uses the Takhalos Asad was written at the age of 19. And, and it was a challenge for him to, you know, measure up to his own self, trying to excel himself and he was unable to. So this, this kind of thing happens. Uh, so, you know, um, this is a really good writer whose work I admire. His name is Stephen Graham Jones. <clears throat> Very prolific, I mean, horribly prolific annoyingly prolific. Um, and the other day someone asked him, what do you do when you get writer's block? And his response was, I lower my standards. <laughs> and I thought that was such a great insight into one, and he's one of the best writers there in working in the field of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Mm -hmm. And he writes two novels a year and about 100 short stories. But that's what he does. He, that's how he breaks through his blocks. He's like, I'm just gonna write a story for entertainment. So I think your point about you know, not taking yourself too seriously and trying to keep going and not saying, oh, this is my masterpiece and pulling a Philip Roth and retiring and declaring to the world you want to retire mm -hmm. and never write again. I'm not sure that, that I would follow that school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and nor would I, it's, it's self-defeating because if, you, if you're an artist or if you consider yourself an artist, uh, then you know that you cannot master art. You can always keep attempting to you know, reach for the, for the ideal. And that ideal is, is in nobody's grasp, you know, on his best day, uh, Duma or Dickens or Dostoevsky or, you know, uh, who have you, uh, they, they felt that, you know, that they had achieved it, that, for that brief feeling before reality again intrudes and, you know, all kinds of disappointments that are 
um, integrated with life, they take over. You, you live for those small highs, but those small highs should not become your, the defining moment of your entire existence, you know. They are just highs and you, you, they give you hope for attempting something like that again, uh, you know, reaching that same level of enjoyment. In, in, in with you, uh, through your involvement with some. So, you know, I have one comment on the ending. So, I thought it was striking that the, well... Again, Don't give away the ending now. Yeah, I should probably not <laughs> But I will uh, just say that the book's ending seems to be about the end of so many dreams of men for power. And I thought that was interesting. Um, there was almost an indictment against Kazmin, as if the author wishes to set the record straight about celebrated scholars and the work that we take as gospel but forget that uh, these people were you know in fact fallible they were not all infallible um what are your thoughts on that this uh, the whole enterprise ajab al mahluqat wa gharab al mawjudat of qazwinis uh, in this book um, is an attempt to impose an in, in his scope also, he intended to impose a kind of order on the universe, a kind of divine order which he felt existed. Uh, and he tried to interpret that, you know, everything according to uh, its, uh, how, how things are described and defined. And he wanted to find order and life and existence, human existence especially. Uh, a cat's life, for example, which I know very well because I have two cats, um, <laughs> is more orderly, is more uh, well-defined. It follows a, a more uh, determined course than a human because we, we have all kinds of strange stuff going on in our heads. So human life is, cannot be defined or whatever we think as uh, an attempt at you know, overpowering something by defining it or you know, by describing it fully entirely does not work. So this was... Uh, I thought that Kazvini would not mind my saying that. <laughs> so um, the reason I also mentioned that is so many times, and this is happening again and again, happened with Juno Diaz, it happened with a bunch of people, that something about an author comes out. and all I'm not sudden, a bad person. I'm not a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, the, the art and the value of the art and the difference, you know, how to separate the art and the artist, these become very dif dif uh, important questions. So that's why I thought it would be, it, it was an interesting thing to observe. But I think we've reached the end of our moderation. I've, I've just had received the message uh, that we should open to questions. Yes, yes, yes. Very happy to have.